2013, and men also make up 75% of suicides. Girls are now 14% more likely than boys to pass exams in English and maths. Boys have more than three times the number of permanent exclusions, with 6,000 permanent exclusions. Much of this is down, I think, to ADHD and ASD, a separate issue in itself, but one that we really need to look at very closely. And 96% of 79,000 people in prison are also male. So, we've got work to do. Thank you very much indeed. Dean Russell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Globally, it is estimated by the World Health Organisation that 800,000 people die every year due to suicide. And globally, one in ten um, are, uh, or one tenth are, are men, three quarters are, are male in the UK. And I do question why is it that men suffer the most with suicide? And I think often it's down to the challenges in society and the fact that we as a male species do not ask for help. During my maiden speech, I spoke about the concept of HOPE being an acronym, that it stands for H-O-P-E, help one person every day. And I think sometimes that one person has to be ourselves. But it's so hard to ask for help when it's seen as a weakness. And I would like to say to anyone who's out there right now who's suffering, to know that it's not a weakness, it's a strength to ask for help and ask for that support. When I look at the social media narrative, when I look at the, the divisive, often, uh, debate around masculinity and around men, I find that I draw back to my belief that we cannot heal divisions by being divisive. We cannot tackle hatred by being hateful. And we cannot show our strength only by belittling those who show weakness. And I think when we look at the debate that we have in this chamber today, it should not be limited to the time we have here. It should be a societal debate around how do we actually tackle these big challenges in society? How do we look at tackling the stigma, not just through medical support and support through NHS, but through the narrative that we provide both as politicians and as members of the public? We need to listen to each other. And sometimes when I look at the world, especially through the lens of social media and the web and the media, I feel like we're in a world full of those shouting. And it makes me ask, who are those who are listening? And so I ask today, let us all listen to what people are saying. Let's not consider men to be the enemy. We are all part of the important fabric of society. We have all got differences. And to anyone who's struggling right now, who's thinking the worst thoughts in their minds, remember that you're unique. You're on this planet of one of seven billion, and you are the only version of you. And that you need to continue your story. You need to be here for one more day. Just give it another few minutes, another hour, another day. Just give yourself a bit more time to find out why you're really here. Because the power of that story, the power of overcoming that, will make a difference to others, and it will make a difference to those around you, and by God, it will make a difference to your family and friends. Because if they do not have you here tomorrow, if they do not have the stories and the joys of the difficult times, as well as the joyful times, then we all lack because of that. So I ask all of us, please, ask for help if you need it, and ask others if they need help. Remember, it's okay to not be okay, as my, right, uh, my uh, honourable friends have said. But it's also okay to ask others if they're okay. It's okay to say to them, you know, are you really okay? Ask them more than once, because that second time, that third time, might be the chance for them to open up in a way that they never have before. So I am so pleased to my mem uh, honourable friend from, from Mansfield for course, uh, organising this debate today, because without it, we may not have these voices. And today, we might change someone's life. And if off the back of today, we stop just one person from committing suicide, even if it's over the next 100 years, that will have made this debate worthwhile. Thank you. David Linden. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, can I say what a pleasure it is to follow the Honourable Gentleman from Watford, who um, I have always thought since he arrived in this House last December that he was an incredibly thoughtful person. I think that speech there just personifies that. So thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful as well to the Honourable Member for Mansfield for securing today's debate. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome to the dispatch box my honourable friend from Warrington North. I understand it's her debut at the dispatch box. Um, she's a fellow member of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme. Uh, and so when I finally shut up and sit down, I'll certainly be cheering her on. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has hugely impacted everyone's lives. Many of our constituents now face insecurity around their employment and financial hardship, alongside having, a, having to deal with restrictions around seeing loved ones. And never before in our lifetimes have we experienced a global pandemic, which effectively shut down society, closed businesses, and asked us all to, to stay at home. So I, I particularly worry about everyone's mental health at the moment. And I know that continued lockdowns and restrictions can be incredibly tough, especially as we now head towards the winter months, full of colder days and, and darker evenings. But today's debate is a, a good opportunity to focus on, on men's mental health. We know, as, as others have said, that men are typically less likely to reach out for help surrounding their mental health. Just uh, over three out of four suicides are by men, uh, and suicide is the biggest cause of death for, for men under 35. Men are nearly three times more likely than women to become alcohol dependent, and men are, are less likely to access psychological therapies than women. Indeed, only 36% of referrals to psychological therapies are for men. Now, I know from personal experience that, that conversations around mental health can, can feel tough, they can be sensitive, private and awkward, but they are so, so important, particularly at the moment. And with further uh, restrictions and lockdowns, we are all more isolated than ever. A survey done in April showed that one in four UK adults had feelings of loneliness compared to just one in 10 before the pandemic. Young people aged between 18 to 24 were mo most likely to experience loneliness uh, since lockdown began. Indeed, before lockdown, one in six said that they felt lonely. Since lockdown, young people are almost three times more likely uh, to experience loneliness with almost half feeling this way. Uh, in a time when we're, we're more of us are feeling isolated and lonely, it's important, therefore, to reach out to our loved ones. Uh, a simple text, phone call, or FaceTime can make the world a difference. But in terms of men's mental health, there still exists that, that stigma around acknowledging that you are struggling uh, and seeking the help that you need. Um, for example, in 2016, a survey conducted by the Opinion Leader for Men's uh, Health Forum found that 34% of men were ashamed to, to take time off work for mental health concerns, compared to 13% for a, a physical injury. 38% of men would be concerned that their employer would think badly of them if they took time off work for a mental health concern, compared to 26% for a physical injury. And I think the Honourable Gentleman Member for Manfield uh, kind of touched on this, but you know, phrases like man up and toughened up, you know, they only reinforce the stereotypes that men should be stoic and face these problems alone. Um, and I think this is dangerous rhetoric and prevents men from pursuing help. And I'm really glad that all Honourable Members who have spoken today have certainly put that on the record. So it's important that men come together uh, and support one another. And that's why I'm, I'm such a passionate supporter of Shelton Men's Shed as well as the men's health group in my constituency led by Jim Malcolmson. But we should uh, be encouraging men to acknowledge that the, the, the stressors of this unprecedented public health crisis will naturally have an impact on our mental health, whether that be due to, to loss of employment, financial insecurity, or just missing our loved ones. I think we would all agree that this is a very tough time for everyone. So my message to everyone, not just to men, uh, but men in particular, is please reach out to your loved ones let them know that you're always there to listen, to take care of one another, because this too will pass. Yeah. Charlotte Nichols. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It is a pleasure to respond to this debate on behalf of Her Majesty's Opposition. As the Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities, I am conscious that we should not seek to pit the problems of men and women against each other, but to aspire to raise outcomes where one is below the other. We have heard a number of important contributions in this debate. Firstly, I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for Shipley and Mansfield for securing it through the Backbench Business Committee. And we see that it is now truly an annual occasion after a year's absence as it fell during the election campaign last year. 
Having read through previous Hansards of previous iterations of this debate, I am both reassured that we are continuing to emphasise these important issues, but also concerned to note that they still need to be raised. The ongoing tragedy of male suicides has continued, with a rate in England and Wales of 16.9 deaths per 100,000, the highest since 2000, and remaining in line with the rate in 2018, making up around three quarters of suicides. Males aged 45 to 49 years still have the highest age-specific suicide rate. A number of colleagues have mentioned charities that work hard in this field, and so I commend the work of Calm, Rethink, Mind and the other organisations highlighted, and I'd also like to remind all members present that the Samaritans can be phoned at any time, day or night, on 116 123. The same messages are given every year and are ever more relevant in 2020 with its stress and fear. Men should feel able to talk about their problems with friends or with professionals. They don't have to do it in public like honourable members have today, but society must accept and embrace a more open understanding of men's feelings and concerns. I include in this men who may be gay, bisexual or transgender who feel alone or scared about their very identities, who must be more supportive of each other. And I note the news today that the government is ending the £4 million funding for anti-LGBT bullying in our schools. This is a real step backwards that will prolong harm for too many young boys. I cannot join Movember, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I praise the members who are doing it this year and hope that they may continue to brighten the spotlight on men's health. Most obviously, COVID has had a disproportionately fatal impact on men. As further research unearths more about what is still a very new virus, we may find out why. On prostate cancer, the second biggest killer of men worldwide, I encourage men to discuss this with their doctors at 50, and black men or men with a family history of prostate cancer should discuss it at 45. On testicular cancer, men should know how to test themselves. It's not taboo to look these things up. Men are more likely to die prematurely than women, including of diseases that are considered preventable. Please don't be too scared to ask questions for fear of some toxic male expectations or image. And thank you to the Honourable Member for Carsholton and Wallington for raising these health issues. We have rightly heard today about the challenges of boys' educational entertainment and the need for schools and the Department for Education to address this. Whether this means more male teachers, more male role models, closer support or attention to alternate teaching methods, it is a real concern. The literacy gap between boys and girls peaks at 16 when children are beginning to consider their choices for life after school. Men are still more likely to be victims of violent crime in the UK and men are nearly twice as likely as women to be a victim of violent crime. And among children, boys are more likely than girls to be victims of violence, while more than two-thirds of murder victims are male. It is also worth mentioning that the male victims of domestic violence and the statistics that show that they are less likely to speak out or confide in somebody about it, they must not be forgotten, something which was raised in a powerful contribution to the debate by the Honourable Member for West Bromwich West. As the days and nights get colder and wetter, it is sombre to think of the thousands of rust sleepers on our streets. The government's actions earlier in the year showed that it is possible to eliminate rough sleeping, but now, once again, there are huge numbers of people forced to choose between a cold winter on the streets of our country or the threat of catching COVID in an overcrowded shelter. And government statistics state that 86% of rough sleepers in England are male. I hope the Minister can say what will be done to end this awful situation. Finally, it is worth remembering that today is International Men's Day and we should consider the problems that men and boys face around the world, where they die on average six years before women, where thousands are forced into becoming child soldiers and gay men in particular are all too often oppressed with threats of violent death. Once again, I thank all of the speakers and hope that next year's debate we will be able to report on progress in these many important areas. Minister Cammy Badenoch. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, just before the Minister starts, 
I must commend the House. I said we'd have to rush through this. I was expecting the Minister to be on her feet with only five minutes to spare. But the House has been so disciplined, speeches have been so to the point, precise, moving and clever. I hope that other people will learn that brevity is indeed the soul of wit. I'm not going to mention the fact that very few women have taken part in the debate this afternoon. Kami Bainlaw. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to be standing at the dispatch box on International Men's Day, and I thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting a debate on this important subject, and I thank all the honourable and right honourable members who have made heartfelt contributions today. I also welcome the member for Warrington South to her position as Shadow Minister. International Men's Day is an opportunity to celebrate men and boys in all their diversity and to shine a spotlight on the issues which affect men from shared parenting to health and well-being. Um, I think it's sad that uh, on a day like this, it seems to be mainly members on this side of the House uh, who uh, felt interested enough to speak. I recognise the shadow spokespeople were here, but it does highlight the fact that this is an issue that many people believe is not important enough to speak on, and I hope maybe next time she will speak to her colleagues and, um, and across the House uh, for this reason. David Lynn. The restrictions on the virtual participation, that might be why there are fewer members taking part in this debate. Okay. Minister. Um, I understand that, but this is not the only debate that has taken place today, and they have been very, very well attended indeed. So it, um, I'm afraid I don't accept that position. And like I said, I hope at the next International Men's Day debate we will see many more members participating in this debate. Um, this government is committed to levelling up opportunity and ensuring fairness for all. As Minister for Equalities, I want to ensure no one is left behind, regardless of their sex or background. Both men and women in the UK benefit from us having some of the strongest equality legislation in the world. The Equality Hub will consider sex along with factors like race, sexual orientation, geography and socio-economic background so we can ensure we are levelling up across the country. This will support data-driven policy to reduce disparity across the Union and make the UK the best place to live, work and grow a business. Levelling up is the mission of this Government and every one of us should be free and able to fulfil our potential. The member for, uh, for Carshalton and Wallington mentioned the coronavirus, which, as we all know, is the biggest challenge the UK has faced in decades, and we are not alone. All over the world, we are seeing the devastating impact of this disease. We know that men have been disproportionately impacted by COVID and that after age, sex is the second largest single risk factor. However, not all men are the same, and not all men will be affected in the same way. My report into COVID disparities showed, for example, that the job you do, where you live, who you live with and your underlying health all make a huge difference to your risk of COVID-19. We recognise how important it is that each individual understands how different factors and characteristics combine to influence their personal risk. The Chief Medical Officer commissioned an expert group to develop a risk model to do just this and DHSC are working at pace on how to apply the model. As well as the impact on lives, COVID has had a huge impact on Britain's livelihoods, those livelihoods which give us pride and a way to support our families. Because, of course, men and women do not exist separately and in isolation. We are part of families, businesses and part of our communities, which is why our support is targeted at those most in need and looks at how issues are impacting individuals, not homogenous groups, so that we ensure a fair recovery for everyone. As a Treasury Minister, I am particularly proud of our comprehensive package to protect jobs, which the IMF highlighted as one of the best examples of coordinated action globally. We have given unprecedented support, as this House has heard time and time again, through the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme and the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, to ensure people can get the support they need, especially those in sectors, in sectors most affected by COVID-19. The members for Watford, Ipswich and West Bromwich East spoke passionately about mental health. The challenges this year have no doubt taken their toll on many people's mental well-being. It is very understandable during these uncertain and unusual times to be experiencing distress or anxiety or to be feeling low, and we know this affects many men. These are common reactions to the difficult situation we all face. Anyone experiencing distress, anxiety or feeling low can visit the Every Mind Matters website and gov.uk for advice and tailored practical steps to support well-being and manage mental health during this pandemic. We, 
Mr. Cross. I wonder if the uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, if the government also consider research by the Samaritans, which talks very much about middle-aged uh, men who are often missed in terms of community-based support um, when facing mental health crisis that can often lead to suicide, and perhaps that could be something that the government factors in, so that those people that are not necessarily so visually seen as the people most at risk can also be supported at times of crisis. I completely. I completely agree with you, uh, Honourable Gentleman. We know that some men are less likely than women to seek help with their mental health, and some can be reluctant to engage with health and other support ser services. So, and it's right that he highlights this. This is why I say to every man that the NHS is open for business. We really want to stress this. I would urge any man, whatever his age or background, who is struggling to speak to a GP and seek out mental health support delivered by charities or the NHS. Services are still operating, and it's better to get help early. The NHS this week launched its Help Us Help You campaign, which uh, is relevant to the point the Honourable Gentleman just raised. It's a major campaign to encourage people who may be struggling with common mental health illnesses to come forward for help through NHS talking therapies, also known as improving access to psychological therapies, which are a confidential service run by fully trained experts. I'm sure the Minister for Suicide Prevention and Mental Health will consider his point and will also consider my honourable friend, the member for Mansfield's request for an action plan for men's uh, mental health and suicide. I would also like to remind people that the Help Us Help You campaigns have sought to increase um, people, from com people coming forward with worrying cancer symptoms, including for testicular cancer and prostate cancer. I know the member for Bracknell spoke movingly about his friend uh, who tragically lost his life and urged men to seek the help that they need, as did the uh, member for Glasgow East. The current campaign will run throughout the winter to ensure that men feel able to come forward and get tested and treated early. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to close by taking a moment to celebrate the contribution. Oh, pardon me. I believe the, um, the Honourable Lady asked about uh, rough sleeping. Um, I just wanted to answer her question on what the government is doing. On the 18th of July, we launched the Next Steps Accommodation Programme, which makes funding available to support local authorities and their partners to prevent previous rough sleepers from returning to the streets. The programme comprises £161 million to deliver 3,300 units of longer-term move-on accommodation in 2020-21, and £105 million to pay for immediate support to ensure people do not return to the streets. On 17th of September, we announced local authority allocations for the short-term funding aspect of this programme. £91.5 million was allocated to 274 councils in England to help vulnerable people housed during the pandemic. And recently, on the 29th of October, we announced allocations to local partners to deliver longer-term move-on accommodation. More than 3,300 new long-term homes for rough sleepers across the country have been approved, and this is backed by government, uh, minister, government investment of more than £150 million. So, as you can see, there is quite a lot that is being done on this issue, which we take very, very seriously indeed. Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to close by taking a moment to celebrate the contribution men and boys make to our society. The member for Rother Valley talked about men and boys in his constituency feeling like they have been forgotten. It therefore seems opportune to celebrate our fathers and our sons, our brothers and our friends, and indeed colleagues this week, and the progress we have made in supporting them under this government. For example, since 2010, we have seen the introduction of shared parental leave allowing mothers and fathers to share the highs and indeed the lows of caring for their new babies. This government is also committed to making it easier for fathers to take paternity leave, as set out in our 2019 manifesto. And subject to further consultation, we are committed to introducing measures to make flexible working the default for men and women, unless employers have good reason not to. As someone who only came back from maternity leave this year myself, I can tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, that my husband was able to take paternity leave and it made my return to work uh, much easier, having two ministerial responsibilities as well as my work as a constituency MP. So this is a, uh, this is a policy that I'm very, very passionate about. Yes, I will give one. Just briefly, I just wondered, that's all very well, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, but would the Minister also look to make it easier for absent fathers to actually have access to their children and, and to speed up the process through the family courts, which is often a tortuous one, which causes so much heartache for so many fathers. 
My honourable friend is right, and yes, this is something that I think we can look into. I also want to recognise the work that he has done to raise awareness of fathers who feel a sense of alienation from losing access to their children. He will be pleased to see that the draft statutory guidance to be issued under the Domestic Violence Bill currently recognises parental alienation as an example of coercive or controlling behaviour, no doubt in part to his representations on this issue. I would like to thank him and my honourable friend for Mansfield, again for their tireless work on these issues and for securing this debate today. And I pay tribute to my honourable friend uh, for Mansfield for his vigorous campaign to support boys from white working class backgrounds. He raised many issues about the way the Equality Act is interpreted uh, as protecting groups when actually what it protects is characteristics which we all have. I think some of his questions, especially around whether we should have a Minister for Women, are above my pay grade, but I think this is something that I will definitely raise with the Minister for Women and Equalities and also with the, uh, with the Prime Minister on his behalf as well. But I want to assure him that the commission I sponsor on race and ethnic disparities is currently studying how we will improve outcomes for these boys in the towns and regions of our country. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the Equalities Whip, the member for Finchley and Golders Green, uh, who rarely gets a chance to speak these days as a whip, for his successful campaign to get the HPV cancer jab given to men and boys. We're very proud of the work that he has done. And um, in that I close, and I'm honoured to have taken part in today's debate on International Men's Day to mark the progress we've made and also to highlight what more needs to be done. Ben Bradley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her response and for the work she's doing to get this equalities agenda right, and particularly the hub that she mentioned, which includes socio-economic and geographical factors for the first time, something I raised in Westminster Hall a few weeks ago and I'm, I'm very pleased about. Uh, welcome the Shadow Minister to her place uh, and also thank the, the member for Glasgow East for, for talking about reaching out to our loved ones at this very difficult time. Uh, a huge thank you, I should also pay to the member for Shipley. I'm very sorry I only got three minutes uh, to speak today because he is uh, you know, equally responsible uh, as I for bringing this debate forward today. That's a great shame, um, but a huge thank you for him. And he gets half of the credit, at least, that colleagues have paid to me uh, in the chamber today. Uh, I'd like to thank all colleagues for their thoughtful contributions. I haven't got time to go through them all, but Shadow Ministers have uh, some very moving and heartfelt ones. Um, International Men's Day is, is one day that we celebrate annually, but it's not a conversation just for uh, one day. It's a chance to raise uh, great role models and huge challenges, things that we can do every day in this House in uh, the very privileged, privileged position that we hold. Uh, the public discourse that I mentioned, the negative attitudes pervade uh, every day. Um, the support that uh, men and boys need uh, is needed every day and is available every day and we should all be helping uh, men to reach out uh, to seek that help uh, and continue to raise uh, the issues that we've discussed today so many around health mental health suicide uh, and our, our services uh, in this house at every opportunity not just on international men's day but when uh, this day has long gone uh, every chance that we can the question